Hi, I'm Chris Ertsun, the Curator of Global Contemporary and Asian Art at the Spencer Museum. And I'm going to introduce um, our speaker tonight, Rohini Devesher. Um, so in 2011, um, Rohini completed her BFA in painting at the College of Art in New Delhi, India. And in 2004, she completed her MFA in printmaking at the Winchester School of Art in the UK. I first met Rohini in 2007-2008 while she was working at Koj, which is a nonprofit kind of arts incubator space in New Delhi. And um, so I, was, I found out she was an artist and I asked her if I could see her portfolio and we sat down at a computer and that's where it began. And then in about 2010, um, I met her again at Art Hong Kong and that evening, I went back to my computer and I wrote to the Spencer Museum and I, I proposed that we um, purchase a work of Rohini's called Bloodlines. And this is a really great work because it sort of encapsulates a lot of her work. It, um, are you going to look at it today? Maybe not. I don't just know. Just the images. Yeah, just the images. But it's, it's in our collection. And uh, it's a work that simulates the cellular mitosis of imagined microbial organisms that were born from the static chaos of video feedback. And over the past decade, <laughs> Rohini has forged a multidisciplinary artistic practice that explores the interface between fundamental laws and processes that govern growth and form in biological and physical systems. And she's also become increasingly interested in astronomy and, uh, and physics. Her recent solo projects include the 2012 exhibition, Parts Unknown, Making the Familiar Strange, which resulted from her residency at the Max Planck Institute for the History of Science in Berlin, Germany. And in, in her 2013 exhibition titled Deep Time was at Koj in Delhi again, and her gallery Project 88 in Mumbai. Most recently, Rohini has created a wall drawing as part, as, as part of the fifth Asian art triennale in Fukuoka, Japan. So she's here today as part of a research site visit in preparation for a project that she will do in 2016 as part of the exhibition Temporal Turn, Art and Speculation in Contemporary Asia. And I'd like to um, thank the Asian Cultural Council for sponsoring her residency. And uh, please join me in, in, please join us when she returns as, as Rohini's work will help us to inaugurate a newly renovated Spencer Museum of Art. So prepare to be dazzled, Rohini Devesher. <laughs> Thank you. Um, is this thing, is this working? Yes? Okay. Uh, just wanted to say quickly before we start, I wanted to thank Chris and Sarah Lynn so much for inviting me to be here. It has been so exciting. And also I wanted to thank all the other curators and the faculty that I've met over the past couple of days who I will meet over the next few days because they have been so generous with their time. And I'm really excited at the possibilities. I also talk really fast, so if I get talking too fast, just tell me to slow down. Okay. <laughs> So what I'm going to do is actually just show you my work. Um, I've sort of divided it into three or four thematic strands because all of them are sort of parallel. They intersect, they overlap. I forget about them for a while, then they come back and that sort of thing. So just as Chris said very briefly, um, I studied painting and printmaking. I'm not going to show you any of that work really, just enough to tell you that the reason I always mention printmaking is kind of because it sort of has defined the way that I work in any other medium that has followed since. Because I am really interested in the idea of working with a block, a plate, a screen, and how you take that one you know, surface and then you build and you, know, you can construct articulated surfaces. So all of the work that you're looking at here, these are digital prints, these are etchings, these are screen prints, these are lithos. And um, so what I would do is like this, these two for instance are really large, they're like eight foot long and about three and a half foot wide. And these were usually built with, you know, I mean, they were constructed in Photoshop with many, many layers of photographs and drawings. 
And what would happen is that, you know, once you finish that, then you print it out, and then it's flat. So I was getting really frustrated with the fact that, you know, how do you make layering visible? Where is the temporality? So I was doing a lot of research on, you know, sort of complexity, chaos, emergence, and things like that, and I saw this image online. So I just clicked on it, and it took me to this page. So this is 2006 I found this page. And it was basically a DIY, do-it-yourself guide to video feedback, which I had never heard of until then. And so what I did was I decided to try it out myself. So what it is, is actually just a handheld camera, any handheld camera, you plug it into a TV so that it's pointing at its own output. So in a sense, it's like those old-fashioned kaleidoscopes. You know, when you have two mirrors that are facing each other, you get an infinite number of reflections. So that's basically what happens. But the thing is that, so just to give you an example, you, you hook up a camera into a TV, you turn down the lights in the room, and you have to fiddle with the settings of the TV. And then what happens is that the camera picks up a point of light. It's fed in a loop between the TV and the camera. And then what happens is that forms are generated that start to mimic biological life. So they look like plant forms, they look like cell forms, like trees, like bacteria. So what's really interesting to me is this, I mean, the reason that, we, that snowflakes look the way they do or the way that you know, leaves look the way they do is the idea of self-organization of pattern in nature and then it's mirroring in the digital. So what I'm going to show you actually really quickly is what video feedback looks like because it's hard to tell otherwise, you know. So this is raw video feedback. I'm just going to show you really quickly. So this is like if you just have a camera and a TV. But it's such a, it's the coolest thing to try and understand, you know, morphology because you have squares turning into circles, turning into, you know, octahedrons. So this is just a camera and a TV. But, you know, it's so cool, right? I mean, I was, anyway, I think it's, I was... I was pretty hooked because up until that point, I was pretty sure I would never be able to do video. But then, um, and so now, now, now you can see, like, this is, uh, this, is, this is the TV, this is the mirror, one mirror here, one mirror there. So then what happens is that the image has that many more surfaces for it to bounce off of. So it becomes like a fractal, basically. And um, the other cool thing is that, one, it is entirely generated within the machine. Two, it's a deeply embodied process. You know, if I'm not doing anything, nothing is going to happen. So sometimes when I breathe, it breathes. Does that make any sense? You know, it's amazing. Um, I'll just show you one more. Yes, can, you, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah, so just this is another example of the kind of stuff. There's a huge range of very dynamic behavior that is possible and... Um, so basically what I do then is that I shoot hours of this footage and so I shoot hours of this footage, I then dump it all on my computer, I chop it up into pieces and then I stitch them together to make work. So what you're looking at is basically what a timeline in Adobe Premiere looks like for me at home. Like these are individual layers of video. So this is a work, each of these is a separate layer of video. So one work will potentially have up to I mean, anywhere from 100 to 200 individually placed layers of video, which are then rendered into one file. So, what I'll show you first is a body of work that basically explores video feedback and is really interested in exploring this mirroring of the digital and the organic. And I'm also really interested in how, with the video feedback, the conceptual is so often embedded in the material, you know, in the sense that the work explores self-reflexivity. And the material itself, which is video feedback, is self-reflexive in, in, in its making, in, its, in, in what it is. So the first piece is called Ghosts in the Machine. And I'll just show you the video because that will, this will really give you an idea of um, how it all began. This is the very first video I made in 2006. And it's very, very simple. It's just, uh, I won't show you the whole thing, but it starts really simply it starts with one layer. It's like, just, just think of it like a little artificial life form, the journey of this little thing. And this is all video feedback. So this is the first, this is just one layer of video. five layers of video, right? So that's sort of how it starts. And this behavior is what it is. This is what was shot. It hasn't really been manipulated in any way. The color hasn't been changed. And that's something I'll come back to a little later. So I won't show you the whole thing. I'm just going to show you what 
will happen like it'll very slowly keep it just keeps getting more and more complicated i keep adding layers And it's, so I show it a couple of different ways, but this is um, projected on a circular frame, which is just covered with black fabric, because I really like the idea of like a moving print. So when you come in front of it and it's an overhead projection, so you're not quite sure if this is a video, is it a print, what's happening, you know, kind of, I like confusion. This is the piece that Chris was talking about. This is called Bloodlines. Um, the reason that, you know, it, it's one of those pieces that was sort of really important. It was an important moment. So what was happening is that at the time I was reading um, one of Richard Dawkins' books that I really enjoyed, it was called The Blind Watchmaker. And the book is about cumulative evolution and how very small changes result in big changes at the end. And there's one phrase in the book which is, um, he describes a warehouse of impossible monsters. And I loved that, you know, this idea of this huge hangar bay that was just filled with organisms that could have been but that are not. So I thought, you know, it would be kind of cool to try and see if I could create like a tree of artificial life. So, what you're looking at here, which you can't really, well, yeah, you can tell. So these seven forms in the middle, I call them the parents because these have been made the way that you saw the work before this, Ghosts in the Machine. So it's been made by individually layering layers of video. So each of them has like 200 layers of video. Once that's done, then it's rendered into a moving file, one file, then it's taken back into the video editing software and then it's mirrored again. I'm sorry, if there's any questions in between about the technical details, I'm happy to answer. But basically what happens then is that I became interested in how far from the parent you could go. So what that means is that this form produced this, this produced this, this produced this, this produced this, this also could produce this, but this could also have been produced by this. So the work took almost a year, and what you see is not all the links along the chain, if you see what I mean. So basically what that means is that when you're in front of the work, the work, the video is actually 45 minutes long. Each of these 63 forms will come one after the other according to their specific little bloodlines. So the, the print is sort of like the key to the work. If you're standing here and you see this form, then you know you're here, and you know, you know what's going to happen next kind of thing. And I became interested in how you know these, these forms when they were being, so I'll just show you this, like this is a parent. So cute. <laughs> <laughs> That was amazing, yeah. So, so this is like a parent form, this is a child, this is a child, you know. So I was, it was really interesting, it was, they start to mimic phytoplankton, they start to look like diatoms in radiolaria, which have these amazing skeletal structures. So I won't show you the video, but we'll just quickly go to um, the next work. So um, I'm also very interested in like L systems. L systems are like a formal grammar that was developed by this Hungarian um, botanist. And it was actually used to model plant growth um, patterns and systems. So this is not based on an algorithm or anything like that, but it is basically exactly the same thing. But this is a, this piece here, this piece here is what the original footage was. And then what I've done is I've just, again, stacked and stacked and stacked. So this video, took me a very long time and was very difficult to render, but if you notice the quality of the color, this is because this was shot on um, an LED TV as opposed to the old cathode ray TVs, which is why it's got this like X-ray-like quality, which I really like because it looks like bone or, you know, like X-ray film. So we'll just go a little forward. It's quite long, but basically what's gonna happen is it's just gonna keep getting bigger and bigger and I really like this piece because, you know, this, this thing, like when it goes to stardust, almost, this is all just the footage, the way it was shot. But it, this was almost like an exercise in drawing with light, which was quite nice. But by the end of this, uh, let me just show you a little bit, because it's quite long.
And then right at the end, we sort of just. So this is my favorite bit because it looks like cross section of bone, you know, which is like really lace like, and or it looks like a star, like a star chart or something. Yeah. So this was. Then, I mean, this is one possible tree. I could have made a hundred, but I didn't. So <laughs> I thought instead, you know, I just wanted to play with the idea a little bit. So I did a set of 12, 20 prints. Uh, these are digital prints. So these are not still frames of the video, but these are made out of the same raw material that went into the video. So these are still frames of video feedback to create like a greenhouse of the other possible trees that could have been videos, but are not. So these are, yeah, this is a, just also related sort of work. And um, yeah, then I'll show you one more video. Uh, this one is called Doppelganger, and this was in sort of the opposite, not opposite direction, but a different direction from bloodlines. So I was really interested in this sort of idea in biology of um, invariant pattern and variable detail. So there, were, there are some things that will always be the same, and there are other things that can be hugely different. So for instance, in this case, you know, there will always be a thorax, there will always be wings, but everything else will change. So this is not shown like this, it's a double channel video which is shown on usually two screens next to each other. And it's about five minutes long, but what will happen is that this one will every 20 seconds or so move to the next level of complexity, whereas this one at the same time will shift into an entirely new dragonfly. Yeah, so we'll just, I'll just go a little forward and show you. And all of this is video feedback. So this, this behavior, this, this kind of, um, this stuff is on the old TV. You know, you get a range of different kinds of behavior, like, so the wings, wait, let me show you. Yeah, like all of this is also video feedback, this stuff. Yeah, but, okay. So these are actually quite small, so they look very nice. They look like, uh, they can be dragonfly size. I've shown them slightly bigger as well. And the most recent in this series is what I call the bone tree series, which are quite large. These are very large dig digital prints. So they're not, I mean, they're all individual prints, not, it's not one work. Um, so it's quite nice because I think of this as like an inversion of Freud's uncanny. So Freud's theory of the uncanny is basically that the uncanny is very rarely supernatural or mysterious. It's usually the banal. And so what I'm looking at is actually looking at quite extraordinary material because I think video feedback is really quite Amazing, and then you know you turn them into or you transform them into quite ordinary things, trees or whatever, but they retain a quality of that extraordinariness, I suppose. So this is not a tree. You know, it could be bone, it could be cartilage, but also then it's digital. So hopefully it's either uncomfortably familiar or uncomfortably strange, and both are good. Any form of discomfort is good, so <laughs> it's all good. So the other work, um, the other body of work, as Chris was mentioning is astronomy. So what happened is that the, actually the year that I joined art school in Delhi, I was looking, I'm a big science fiction geek. I love sci-fi and speculative fiction. And I was actually looking for like a group, um, like a sci-fi club. Delhi didn't have that, but they had these guys. These are the Bohemians or the Amateur Astronomers Association of New Delhi. And they would meet every Sunday on the roof of the Delhi Planetarium, and they were amazing. So, you know, people from all walks of life, all ages, that would just get together, and we would hang out and go and see meteor showers and eclipses and stuff like that. And, you know, I was very active for a long time, and then I lost touch with them. And then what happened is that in 2009, um, India was witness to, like, the longest total solar eclipse of the millennium, or so they said. It was almost seven minutes of totality. So I went back to, um, to Patna, which is where it was. It's just south, I mean, it's far south of Delhi to see the eclipse, and we didn't get to see it, unfortunately, because it was completely occluded. This is after, I don't know if you can see it, this is after the eclipse is finished, and then the clouds clear. But, you know, so we were on the roof of the Patna Planetarium, it's absolutely, it's pouring, it's dark, but it was the most electric moment. I mean, it was one of those moments when, you know, I was, mo I was hugely aware of my position on the planet, if that makes any sense, and it was like, there's something here, and I have no idea what it is, but I want to do something with this. So um, there was a I applied for a fellowship in Delhi, and I got it. So I got a chance to basically, 
it started with interviews. I started to interview amateur astronomers in Delhi, and I was just asking them, you know, why do you do what you do? What is it that makes you want to do this? What draws you to the night sky? And then as part of that, I started to travel with them, and I went to some amazing sites, including this one, which is a high altitude observatory in Ladakh, which is very close to the Chinese border. And you know, these are incredible landscapes. These are just, um, and I became really interested in this, but it was also a very difficult transition because for me, I couldn't figure out how this had anything to do with what I had done before. So there was a, like lots of confusion. But then the first work that came out of it was actually a sound piece. Because I realized that when you're trying to describe an eclipse to someone, you cannot do it with images. This is the first time I realized that, and I'd only ever worked with image, you know, but this is the first time I realized it could not be image. It almost has to be something else. So the work is called Shadow Walkers, and it is a 12 minute sound piece, and it's nine voices, nine astronomers talking about the single most transforming moment, which is standing in the shadow of the moon. And it is, I mean, you know, it still makes the hair stand up on my arms because it's like uh, the voices range from a very young, you know, young astronomer who had rewound on a cassette because this was in 1980, he had seen his first total solar eclipse. He rewound Pink Floyd's comfortably numb to the guitar solo because he wanted to hear only that during the eclipse. But when the eclipse happened, he had to throw it away because he just couldn't, you know, it was too much. To this other guy who is like a poet, you know, when you hear him, you just feel like, he just talks about a shining black, you know, and seeing his own reflection in that. So anyway, the, the other part of it is that I invite people to lie down under the sky, because in Delhi, the other thing that's happening is that we're basically losing the stars. Light pollution is such a huge issue. And I don't know what it will do to people when, you know, you grow up without the stars. I think it's a huge, I mean, I think it's something physiological, it's psychological when all you're doing is this instead of, you know, that. So it's also an exercise in, you know, come down collectively, let's all, sleep, you know, and look up and then just listen to these voices. So I've shown this a few times and maybe we can, you know, show this here as well because it's really easy to do. It's just a yoga mat and a iPod or a phone or whatever. And um, yeah, but anyway, so coming back to this, uh, a lot of the other work that is coming out of this astronomy research is realizing that astronomy and art actually have a lot that actually tie them together. And one of them is metaphor and the other is projection. So the idea that, you know, when we're looking at anything unfamiliar, we just recycle past impressions and we keep projecting, you know, that onto this. So that was a really interesting way for me to look at a lot of this work. And um, the work that has come out of that is basically all explorations of sort of strange terrains um, that are part myth, part fiction. Um, this is a piece that was at the Kochi Biennale in 2012, and it's a seven channel uh, video installation. It's called Paths Unknown and there's a wall drawing at the back. I'll just very quickly show you what the videos look like, just briefly so you can, yeah. So it's so slow that you almost, some people thought that they were just light boxes, but basically what happens is that it is a footage that was shot in Ladakh and it's overlaid with drawings and with satellite images of other parts of the earth. And you know, it, I'm, I'm just really interested in, in the telescope becoming this kind of chimeric, you know, instrument that is also both fact and fiction and it's one thing standing in for something else, looking at something else, you know, and how do you make remote spaces, almost physical spaces in the imagination. So yeah, so as you can see, all the, all, the only thing that happens really is that the sun shifts across the landscape um, in this case. And there are seven videos, so I'll just show you this and I'll show you one more, but I'm just waiting for my favorite bit, which will happen now when this shadow comes here. Yeah. And then like in this one, it's just very slow. The only thing that will happen is that the rain will fall. So it's, it's nice also because then, you know, man is implicated, but he is not present in any of the frames. It's just very, I'm just gonna go quickly forward, but that's the only thing that will happen. And there are seven of these, different perspectives of the different kinds of landscapes, and there's a wall drawing at the back. So the wall drawing is really because I didn't want to show them like as a regular sort of you know, seven channel video. So I plotted them like the seven sisters, the, play the Pleiades or the Pleiades, and then the star chart at the back is actually that quadrant of space. So it's just charcoal and acrylic on the wall. Um, then I've also done a series of very large 
sort of hybrid print and drawing works. These, I call these monographed geographies um, because again, they're sort of an exercise in alternative maps sort of thing. So they're, they're both the valley, the mountain, and the desert, and they're sort of, you know, my drawings on top of them that sort of explored or implored or ruptured the landscape. And these are quite large, so they're all 12 foot long, but not very wide. And um, yeah, it's a digital print, and then it's color pencil on top of it. And then I've done, this is the last work in this series, which is um, making the observer the observed. So these are, you know, top-down images taken from this NASA WorldWind, which is an open source software, because Google Earth won't let me use images, right? But these guys will. <laughs> so these are just images of the same uh, telescope array. But I love that it looks like something out of Arthur C. Clarke's Rama series, you know. I, I think it's an amazing. So these are basically unique works. They're drawings on digital prints. And now we come to something that is sort of peripatetic. It's just, it keeps popping up through my whole thing. The first wall drawing I ever did was uh, 2004. And the most recent, as Chris mentioned, was last year. So these are very close to me. The reason being that they are, you know, they're, they're always site specific. They're always in a space. Um, the wall is usually built for the work and then it is torn down after the show or whatever. And with all of these, I'm interested really in this idea of um, a self-aware landscape or a cognizant landscape or a landscape that looks back at you. And um, these are also quite large. This one is uh, 30 feet. And, uh, like, and also, it, the, the process is very similar. Like This has also been stitched together on the wall. I have tons of reference material. This is like made up of a bunch of different coral drawings and things. And um, I like playing with architecture, you know, because um, when you stand in front of this and you can feel the curve of the wall, there's sort of like this dissonance at the edges of your vision, which is kind of cool. This is the only one that is permanent because it's in Germany, it's on their wall. All the others have, did I do something? And this is the one that was most recent in Fukuoka. And I mean, I think already you can see it's less creature-like than the others because I suppose my other work has shifted more into this sort of mapping. So this was called North is Up, question mark. And I, it's sort of a thing on Buckminster Fuller's Dymaxion map, you know, where there's no up, there's no north, there's no south, there's only in and out. So I sort of worked with the corner and was interested in this idea of, again, implosion, explosion. Are you looking from a bird's eye view or are you right in the middle of it? And um, I'm going to show you now, this is, we're almost at the end. So this is just the most recent work. This is uh, all new. Um, it's going to be in the next show, hopefully, which will be in a couple of months in Delhi. Um, now, what can I say about this? Basically, um, over the past couple of years, I've realized that there are two things that are really interesting to me, the sort of modes of expedition and field work, both of which I think are really interesting ways in which we construct the environment and the environment in turn constructs us and how, you know, it gives us, I think, great it tips, or no, not tips, sorry. It makes us understand a lot about human meaning making, which is really, and the only thing that is common with any of the work that I show you next is that it's a little bit uncanny and a little bit remote. Um, this is a series of 12 etchings, and it's just a meditation on clouds, because like I said, I have been to the highest observatory, in, in the second highest observatory in the world, the one in Ladakh. I have been to the Scottish Dark Sky Observatory, which is the darkest site in Europe, and I have still not seen the Milky Way, because everywhere I go, the clouds follow me. So, <laughs> so then there was this long period of like just thinking about how annoying that was, and then I found these guys. And I thought, how amazing is that? You know, because theirs is the, the pledge to fight blue sky thinking. And it's the entire, op the, it's, the, it's the opposite end of the spectrum from the amateur astronomer. Because when they sign off their emails, they say clear skies, clear skies. Everything is clear skies. So this was basically like a little meditation on this polarity, you know, of, um, so these were basically clouds that I photographed over observatories. And these are etchings, these are photo etchings. And it's, uh, yeah, it's a set of 12. Um, uh, this work is called Terrasphere, and I am, it was basically, so what you're looking at is a video projected onto a pedestal covered with a mirror, and I'm really, I love terrariums, I love the idea of enclosed little biospheres and systems, so I'll just show you the video because it's kind of hard to tell what this is, but... 
But obviously the video isn't supposed to be seen like this, but you'll get the idea. So it's actually just still frames that I made in Photoshop. So these are just still frames that have been stacked one after the other, and then they've been blended together so that it becomes like a sort of stop motion animation. And it goes, it also has a little day and night cycle, which is nice. And what will happen is that over the course of this video, it was slowly going to get fogged up. So the humidity levels and the moisture levels and the foliage levels will grow. And so it's projected on this pedestal below you. So it's, it's, it's actually quite nice when you look down on it. This is what it looks like. So it's projected on a, and I like the little eclipse that happens accidentally <laughs> underneath. Yeah, so, uh, and okay, so then the other thing is that like, um, I'm doing a video on, this is, um, these are amazing. These are anti-aircraft World War II sea forts that are in the Thames estuary. And I found them quite by accident while I was doing a residency in the UK. So I'm, I'm, I'm working on a video right now which is looking at these amazing things because they look like something out of Star Wars, they look like something out of H.G. Wells, you know, and so I'm doing this piece which has text and video and the text has nothing to do with this. It in fact is something that a curator sent me that she did during her PhD. So she went to the lightning fields in Texas over 10 years and she did this lovely text and it is beautiful because it talks about symmetry and grids and chaos and pattern and it just works. So I've just taken the text and she was really, she said, you know, do what you want. So I've treated it sort of like an annotation. I've just taken bits and pieces and that's what this work will be. Um, this is a video which I can show you if you like or I can just leave it like this. This is, it's called Consider Again This Dot and basically it's like again a, a different look at the blue marble. So the, the image that we all associate with the earth is the blue marble image that was taken from space. So this is actually um, a radio telescope array in Bangalore, and what you're looking at are these amazing, these are radio telescopes, radio heliographs, and the video, I can just show that to you actually, just maybe just very quickly if you like. So these are all uh, telescopes, what you're seeing. So I quite like the idea of this, you know, bisection across the sky, and it's very slow again. And all it is is just different frames of these telescopes. And it's going to be... It's about Sorry. They're not complete yet, that's why. <laughs> but there's a lovely bit at the end where all these bugs dance over the camera, which was entirely unintentional. So that's kind of cool. Yeah, so that's that one. And... Um, I'll just end with this work. I'll just show you the video. So I'm really interested in the color blue for some reason. And um, there is an 18th century instrument called the cyanometer, which is basically a circle. And it was used to measure the blueness of the sky. So there were little pieces of paper that were dipped in Prussian blue. So it goes from white to black through 52 shades of blue. And that was what was used to measure the blueness of the sky. So this is sort of my little, you know, homage to that. It's um, the same thing. The sky goes from white to black through 52 shades of blue, and it's very slow, so, you know, but it's called helio blue because this is, again, a radio heliograph which is measuring the sun and in the blue sky at the back, so. But it's very slow. And then birds will come and sit on this and then fly away. And that is it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Plenty of time to talk. So. Yeah.
Oh, was that, I just, was it this one, one sec. It was, they're all projected on top of it. So if you mean, I think, ghosts, then this one? Yes. Yeah, so this is projected, it's a ceiling projector, but it's projected onto a circular wooden frame, which is just stretched with fabric. Good question. And are you just as satisfied uh, with the creation of the piece in that others might not appreciate all of the technical aspects? What I do like to do and what I like to not insist on, but yeah, kind of, is that uh, I always have some text there, not necessarily on the wall next to the work, but just close by. Because it's just, I think it adds another layer of meaning. But if you choose to, that's up to you. If you choose not to, that's fine. You know, it's okay. But I would like, because there are also, these things are also possible through softwares, you know, which is, it's not like, that's fine as well. But I mean, I'm interested in the process and where it comes from. So I would like people, I leave it there for, for them to choose to want to find out. Yeah, it's a good question. It varies a lot. It just depends. Like, Ghosts in the Machine had sound that I recorded and I put in. Bloodlines has only sound. Bloodlines is the one where you have the whole, that only has sounds in the transition from one um, family to the other. So that, and the, the doppelganger, which is the dragonflies. In, jo in Japan this time, in fact, I collaborated with a sound artist for the first time and we put a soundtrack onto it. I couldn't show that because I don't have a high-res file, but that is an amazing, because he has managed to do something to it, you know, which was, yeah, but it's a um, good question. Like, I think for Shivering Sands, which is the sea forts, there will be sound for the first time again, but it will, it will be like ambient, seagulls, water. Does that help? Yeah. yeah. And, but then, yeah, so it, it's a good question. It comes and it goes, and I'm trying to figure out how. Sometimes it just changes. Because it can be really strong, you know, it can really change the work a lot. Yeah. You said it was the same work, you said it was projected from above. Yeah. How do you manage to have it be symmetric? Usually when you project from above, yeah. and this is like this, it becomes a little bit. No, I mean, you, you do it a little bit back, it's not too close, and then masking. It's very annoying. All my videos involve huge amounts of standing up and masking the projector. It's a pain. It's a pain for most people. But you know, like the Terrasphere, which is the one below, the mask is actually just a pinhole, like the, the top of the nib of a pen, just that much. That's what the video is coming through, to make sure that it doesn't spill all over the floor. Yeah, but you, you, just, you have to keystone it and take it a little back, and then it's fine. It works out. Mm. And experiencing it and transporting <coughs> yeah. somehow a sense of. And I'm wondering what you think that relationship between your and the expedition is. Because it's, uh, it seems to me there's something there about finding your place on the planet. Mm. Ooh. Is this being recorded? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. Because I think, you see, what um, I, don't, I don't know if I can answer. I'll have to answer it a different way. Um, what was a revelation with the astronomy stuff, for instance, is for the longest time, I kept making it about them until another artist who is, you know, like a mentor. And we, he was like, you know, but why are you taking yourself out of the equation? I mean, you know, you are the amateur astronomer, so it's coming through you. You are the filter. And that was a real, like, oh, yeah. So, it, you know, it has to come from me and it's, yeah, I suppose it's my way of just trying to understand what's going on and why I'm interested in these things. So for instance, 
Like I said, I think there's a huge resonance between the am amateur astronomers and storm chasers, because it's the same kind of wanting to be part of something that's much bigger than yourself, but also time scales being so different. So where amateur astronomers are used to deep time and you know, nothing changing, I would imagine with storm chasers, everything changes in minutes and in seconds, you know? So what is that like? And, and it's, yeah, it's really interesting. I didn't answer the question. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I will think about that, yeah. Yeah. Which is all very slow time scale. Yeah. Why did you choose such a time Yeah, I might. I think part of it is just that I... Good question. I think shivering sands is, oh no, that's also slow. Uh, I think I like, I would like people to slow down a little bit maybe. Some of what I see also in the art is too much of, is too, I don't know, uh, that doesn't know, that's not the right thing to say. Just the way that I, the way that I feel, it's very, it's very intuitive. I don't, I don't really know how to, how to, how else to say it. It's like how I feel it needs to be. Um, for, th for those works, it's possible that there might be a piece that I work on which will be, you know, because actually that's super sped up. You just couldn't tell. <laughs> Consider this dot is 300 times faster than it should be because it's much slower. It's really fast. But also, I also want people to just spend some time and, you know, look at the colors of the sky changing. But it is a, it might be fast. I don't know. Not, I'm not yet. No, I don't really think I have, uh, it's very, it's different. I would say rather that this is just in an abstract way. I mean, no, for me personally, it's just the way I happen to, you know, um, ingest this and the way that I express it. But I feel like, and there are different ways, different practitioners who work at the intersection of art and science do it. I do think that we're, maybe, you know, there are different perspectives that are offered. It's more open-ended, that's all, you know? So like you could see, the clouds and not make any connection to anything except something else. Or you might see Terrasphere and think it's only science, whereas it's not, you know what I mean? So I think it's pretty open. And this just happens to be how, yeah. Yes. We really have a great number of questions to ask, so I don't That's know good. which one to ask you. Anyone. <laughs> let me ask one that I don't think um, anyone so far has touched on, and that is that Obviously, you are grounded uh, in India. Yeah. And I say that I know, but what I do know is that it is the opposite. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you see those divine forces. It's a good question. Anywhere at work, in there. In that, in fact. Fabulous. Well, yes and no. What I will say is that what is very interesting to me, because I, um, when I was looking at the amateur astronomy stuff, right, when I was talking to these guys and when I was interviewing them, the things that would keep coming to my mind were words like rapture, rapture and pilgrimage, but not at all with any sort of spiritual um, overtones, if you see what I mean. So I think it's sort of the other way around. I think the sublime lies in this I don't see, for me it's, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much an atheist actually, so I don't personally feel that. But what I think is very interesting is, I was talking to the director of the Max Planck Institute, um, and she is in one of the sound pieces that I've done. So I was asking her about this, because one of the sound, which I wish I had his, I might have his sound recording here. So this is a, an, an astronomer who says that when he is, sometimes lies down under the night sky, you know, he, tears just start to flow, and he is not sad, he is not happy. It's just this wave that he is sending out that is being reflected back at him. But it is not divine in that sense. For him, it's just this connection with something larger than himself, you know? So maybe I think, I mean, I don't want to say that, but then maybe, you know, religion sometimes puts the cart before the horse. Maybe these emotions also come from 
I don't know if that answers the question. No. Oh, it does. Um, <laughs> one thinks, well, what is, what is the spiritual? What is the yeah, I mean, I think everybody has their own, yeah. What is that that is larger than ourselves? Everything. Absolutely. Yeah. But it seems that even when you're looking at mm -hmm. um, as well as the imagery that you create with skies, mm -hmm. whether it's um, there is this quality of wonder that there is. Thank you. I'm glad. Yeah. And um, it obviously is related to the fact that. It's the natural Yes. It is transcendent. Yes. Well, I think wonder is one of those things that's got a really bad rep for no reason in the art world, you know? It's really sad because I think wonder. So yeah. I mean, and so actually, the. the but I think the, the line also between the wonderful and the strange is something that's really interesting to mm -hmm. explore because the two can be very similar and very, you know, so that's also what I'm very interested in. And how has our understanding of where do we go now for that experience, you know? So the, the amateur astronomer or the storm chaser perhaps is looking, you know, where do we go now for the wonder now that we are, you know, in this age of the Anthropocene or mm -hmm. things like that, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate all the amazing things you do. Thank you. Especially is uh, the same most things from a different angle, and uh, there are some standards for you to mm. build things which you think are valuable to find or to take a video of them. Very good question. You know, um, it's a very good question. It is all about trust, and it comes with age. <laughs> <laughs> I swear. Because I, you know, I mean, if you'd asked me this question 10 years ago, the thing is, really, it is about trust and trusting yourself and knowing that you have to follow your gut and just follow your instinct. Like, you know, when I was on that rooftop at the planetarium and the eclipse was happening, and it was just a feeling, you know, like... And then someone... Like, I got the fellowship, so that's, you get the affirmation as well, it's validation, that helps a lot, you know, it's just, but you have to trust, and in the art world also it can be tough, because it's, you know, it's, it can be negative, it can be, but then that's true for anything, really, I think it just comes with trusting yourself, and then a lot of stuff doesn't leave the studio, a lot of the stuff stays on the hard drive and will never see the light of day kind of thing, but you start to believe that, you know, there's a reason why you're doing these things, and that happens, I think, just with Believing that, yeah, trust so just in yourself. Yeah, believing in yourself. No, God really doesn't enter the picture. I'm sorry to say for myself. <laughs>